I this morning I just like to share with you a season of my life when God took me aside and taught me about how to live and serve Him with a pilgrim's heart. So that's why I titled um, my sharing as Serving with the Heart of a Pilgrim, a Lawyer's World Story. So the word pilgrim points to a person who is living in a place as a temporary resident, but whose home is somewhere, somewhere else. And the Bible generally, in a way, describes the people of God to be strangers in this land, on a journey passing through to the ultimate home. So what does that mean to us in this 21st century? Uh, how are we to think about ourselves as pilgrims working on earth, on a journey to the new heavens and new earth? What, what do we have to change in our heart posture? What do we have to change in our perspectives? And um, as I learn, I realize that when we work with the heart of a pilgrim, we focus on the eternal. Our heart starts to look at the joy of eternity. But at the same time, this posture actually liberates us to love and to work with zest and hope. That's how it is. So I would like to share this journey of learning with you. So a little bit of a background. So um, my both sets of grandparents moved, migrated from uh, China to Malaysia. And um, our family religious affiliation is Buddhist Taoist. But like many Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia, our conduct, our um, thinking is very much actually shaped by Confucianism. Although we say we are Buddhist, although we are Taoist, but actually Confucianism actually influenced deeply the Chinese diaspora in Asia. So, and uh, um, initially I um, was very antagonistic against Christianity. Very antagonist, you know. And, but God in His mercy led me to Him in my early 40s. And um, because I got to know Him at such a late stage, I felt I, felt I lost so many years. I, I just wanted to redeem the time. So I, you know, I was a voracious readers of Christian books. I, uh, after work late at night, I would attend Bible College of Malaysia. And I just, um, there was just this urgency to know him. This, this desire to try to keep in steps with him. And I was on a very exciting learning curve about our Lord, you know. And then in my early 50s, I started to hear the Lord's call to move with the family to Canada. And to me, that was a very difficult and very inconvenient call. Because by then, I had clocked in about 30 years of legal practice. And by all accounts, I had a thriving practice. I have a very good team of partners. I have faithful employees. We have very loyal clients. And um, very importantly, I felt I had clocked in good, I paid time for good service. And I belong to a very standard family. We are very close and vibrant church community. So why would God want me to leave all this? Not that I haven't worked for them. I have. Why would he want me to leave all this to go to Canada, whom I own there? I only have my sister and husband as a couple with family. And another couple that I met through that, uh, a Chinese couple who are lawyers there, nobody else. What would I do? So I, I kept asking the Lord, the call kept coming, and I couldn't understand. I see, you know, I kept asking the questions about what would I do in Canada? You see, we call ourselves human being, but actually we, we should be called human doing. Because we're all defined by our works. We tend to think 
What do I do? Why am I going to do that when, I'm, when I go to the party? Who, who am I going to meet to do something with? It's always like that. So I keep asking the Lord, you know, what would I do? I can't practice law in Canada because I'm not a member of the bar. All my experience and my knowledge gained while working these 30 years in Asia would be of no relevance in Canada. And all my contacts, my social contacts, my professional contacts would be of no value in a new country. So, you know, I, I was on my knees often. Whenever I, because it's very difficult when you think that you hear the Lord's call and you're not obeying. It's one of the toughest things. You sit and you sing with joy in, in the church and then you think, but I'm not obeying him. It's a very tough thing, you know. So, and um, the Lord gave me none of these answers. Thank you for getting somebody else to come and speak. <laughs> no. So, um, and so, and, and the Lord gave me no answers, you know, as I asked him, he was silent. And I struggled for three years. I struggled with him for three years. Uh, and it was difficult. I, just as I was resistant, he was persistent, you know. You see, I, I journal regularly. Maybe this is the lawyer's bad habits. Because lawyers believe the best evidence rule is in writing. So I write everything to the Lord. I will remind the Lord, remember I wrote this two years ago? But you never answer me. <laughs> best evidence rule, because it's all in writing. So, and sometimes the Lord responds in writing. You know? You write, I, I will do something in my early morning prayer, email would come, and it will come with something that only I know I spoke about. It's a simple, the Lord is, the Lord is always there. So, early in the morning in June, I was praying again. This is close to three years now, I was struggling. I was on the floor crying my heart out early in the morning, just pleading with him, why would he send me? Why would he send me when I worked so hard? And I have such an extended family, such a good community, you know, and he let me you know, all the crying uh, red eyes, you know, then I read my devotional and he led me to read um, the devotional, My Outmost for His Eyes by Oswald Chambers. Oh, yes. You know, how he is. Oswald Chambers doesn't mince his words. Yeah. So it says, if you believe in Jesus, you are not to spend all your time in the calm waters, just inside the harbour, full of joy, but always tied to the dog. You have to get out, past the harbour, into the great depths of God and begin to know things for yourself, begin to have spiritual discernment. So that morning, you know, I, even when I think about it, you know, I was on the floor and I read this. And the truth of the matter is that I was very comfortable in my little corner of the world. You know, I, um, I clocked in about 30 years of practice by then. Right? And, you know, I have a good team of partners, lawyer, lawyer clients, yeah, very good employees. And, you know, so I felt that that was most important. I felt a sense of entitlement. I felt I worked very hard for this, Lord. What would I do in Canada? kept asking him, no indication. If only he would tell me, you do this, I probably would say, okay, maybe it's a down step, but I will go. But he gave me no indication. So when I read this, I realized, he says, you are to get out past the harbor into the great depths of God and begin to know things for yourself, begin to have spiritual discernment. And that really put my heart. But of course, all this is years later when I reflect, I think of this, right? On that morning, what really shook me was the message that came with that morning devotion. We do not cut the moorings. God will have to break them by a storm and send you out. <laughs> so I told the Lord, no need to bring the storm, Lord. <laughs> you know, I will go. Yeah, it was, of course, at that time, it was, 
I mean, you know, deep down, you have been resistant. I was so comfortable, comfortable here. Why would I go? You know, I have a good team. So, but when I know this, and, and I don't want him to send a song, so in the end, we left. So when we, my husband and I, Dodo, when we left um, to Canada, um, I hung on to the words, uh, I think I have it here, to move to Canada. I hung on to Hebrew 11.8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So I told myself, I must be courageous like Father Abraham. I, you know, and I told myself, at least I know where I was going. He did not even know where he was going. So at least I know I was going to Canada. So, and we left, my husband, my daughter and I, we left, and um, we landed at a place. I tell you, the first night when I landed there, the way I cried, I had never cried before. Of course, I cried deeply and, and um, felt great loss when my father died. We were very close. But that night in Canada, when we first arrived, it was like, I don't know where I was. You know, when you're so full of life here, and then you go to a place where you are so, literally every relationship seems to be severed, I just feel that I don't know where I was, you know. I just want to say, when I landed in Canada, everything in our lives would turn upside down, you know. Um, my husband and I were already in our 50s. Um, our daughter, Celine, is here with us today. She was in her teen, you know, and when we were there, we have to ask, do we buy a house, right? Um, do we get a car? Oh, we can't even get a car, we have to get a license, right? And then, uh, you know, where do we do our banking? Uh, where do we put seed into school? Everything, every aspect of our life will turn around. I felt we have moved years back. You know, I only have two pairs of people we could go to. You know, here, everything is almost like a phone call away, right? Here you face with certain things, you, you just know who to reach out. The connections are here. Then, who do I call? It, you, I remember um, one, of the, one of the early morning I woke up, I just felt as if I had lost all my identities. You know, and you, you will feel, because a lot of us think that I'm a child of God. When I meet new people, when they, and usually when we meet new people, very soon people ask you, what do you do? What do I say? Do I say, oh, I'm a child of God? It's not easy. So it was a time whereby I felt so lost in the world and felt that all my identities in the marketplace are stripped off. I really do not know how to use the lingo because we don't know how much being, for us, a lawyer, uh, being working in some place, all these are like badges of honour. We say we are a child of God. But when all these badges are taken away from you, it is not easy to carry a conversation when you're so used to using your identities in the world to speak. It is so easy, but when you have no more identity, when people meet you and you don't know where you are, do you walk with that confidence, that oh, to say, but I am a child of God. So it was a very um, difficult time um, uh, in that sense to, uh, to work on. So I felt very lost, but as I moved, I also felt very found in that sense that although I'm stripped of my marketplace identities, I started to feel the liberty of being a child of God. You know, and I, he was with me at every turn of a dilemma, of every crossroad. 
because I, I, you know, my husband is yet a believer, so please pray for him. But when we were there, we have to make grand decisions together. Where do we live? Do we rent? Do we buy? Do we buy? How do we do? Here, all aspects of our life are settled. We were in our fifties, you know, things are going far away. But then everything has to be. So, I and I told Lord, I don't want to make any decision. You brought me here, Lord. I don't want to make any decision without you. So I was on my knees all the time, and my husband would be drumming. He said, "He will come and see your God has not spoken to you yet. <laughs> not yet." <laughs> so it is that way because it. it all aspects of our life are turned into question marks. So it was a very trying time, but it was also a most liberating time. Because when you start to put your uncertain heart into his head, and he becomes the driver, that liberty is, I could taste it in my mouth. Right? While we are here, we don't, almost don't need to have the liberty because everything, your job is going there, you have a home, you take this route to this to office, everything is kind of. But when suddenly you're stripped of this, you you have no identity, you don't know who you are in the marketplace, and then you are just going about in a play, new place, learning languages, learning new way of communication, you realize that he is there everywhere. So resting my uncertain heart in his hand, I truly started to understand and experience the liberty, the blessedness of being called a child of God. I'm a child of God. What identities can match them? What identity? So once you know that and you start to walk with him, his presence is so tangible, I have vision. There were times I have vision where I see him walking into my room. I never had, I didn't have that, that, but because I'm locked in there with him, in a new strange land, that kind of palpable presence I've never experienced before. So I urge all of us to always venture for the unknown with him, when he challenges you, when, he, when you think he's stripping you off of your identity, that is where he got you, at the best place, at the best place. So, you know, I started to feel what it is like to move as a child of God. In a way, that's all I was there. You know, here, before I left, I was, I had a full life. I mean, by all accounts, I had a very vibrant practice. I had a good team of partners, very loyal clients. And you know, on the government front, I was active. I was serving as a city councillor. I sat on the Federal Committee for Women, you know, and um, in the church, I was active in various roles to serve. So, going to Canada, nothing, right? Nothing. And I didn't even know how to introduce myself. So I just didn't know how to say, do I just say, oh, I'm a child of God, when people ask you, what do you do, right? It's not easy. So, it, but because of all that, suddenly you know, all you have is God. Amen. And that's all you need is God. Amen. If we are with Him, we are not lost. I'm not lost in Canada. I'm in his land. So therefore, my heart started to enlarge. My heart started to want to get out and say, what is there for me, Lord? Where do you want me to go? I won't ask these questions when I'm here. I'm too tight with, I have to do this at five. This is an appointment that I have to attend this. I have to, I'm too tight. I, I hardly, the breathing space to say, oh, I don't know what to do. That's never that. But there, I could say, where do I go? Where do you want to go? Who do you want me to meet? Send me new people. I don't know who are the ones around me that you want me to connect with. So all those questions directed to God 
pacing. We should be doing that every day because we are so engaged with what we are doing. We are not looking up. We are just looking around, not looking up. But look up occasionally, even where we are planted and say, is this where you want me to do? And sometimes when he put a thought, don't brush it aside. That's why I always say private time with God. That's when he gets you. Private time with God. I've been studying so hard, I haven't been having private time with God. Lord, forgive me. So, and uh, but that's important. So what did I miss? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, while it was a very difficult time for us when we left, yeah, for us, in a way. Well, um, um, my daughter Celine then, I mean, we were both, my husband and I were both 50s when we left. Who moved to a place at 50s? <laughs> you know, you, later maybe 30s or 40s, but 50s, um, my daughter was, uh, as a teen, every aspect of her life would turn into a question mark, right? Uh, do we buy a house? Uh, do we buy a car? Oh, we can't even buy a car, we have to get a driving license. So we have to go for a driving test. My poor husband failed three times. <laughs> because he said, I don't need, I was driving. He, he drove all the way to Inner Mongolia with the team. So, driving test? Failed. <laughs> so, so, it was like this. It was, uh, where do we go? Where, where to do our banking? All this. But I would Every question I'll put to the Lord because I told Lord, you brought me here. You will let me know. And my husband will, poor thing, will come and see you. God hasn't so, spoken to you yet? Not yet. So we will be doing this all the time. But that is how we got. So, but within a year of landing there, the Lord led me to a wonderful opportunity to work with one of the largest law firms in Canada. You know, because of the... Um, experience that I have here because of the context I have here the firm wanted to be more uh, to really offer to um, very high net worth families to work with their um, holistic global estate and how to transfer their wealth how to transfer the transition knowing that the baby boomers generation are all coming of age for that so um, so I then return regularly I would come back four to five times a year to work with families in five countries in Asia so it was it was not something that, oh, so when, when I obey the Lord, you know, obey in inverted comma, you know how it is fought for a long time, but obey Him in the end, um, I thought for sure my work ministry would be diminished. I was so sure. Because what could I do in Canada, right? Yet, He not only enlarged the territory that I could work in, he gave me opportunities beyond I could believe. It was not something when you trust the Lord. He takes you to places you don't imagine. Amen. You, know, you just have to put that key in his hand yes. to open the lock to our hearts. So, and, and therefore, you know, um, Soon I was um, coming back very regularly and where, where am I? Let me just see. Um, yeah, I wanted to say this. I, I forgot to put it on the slide. Uh, maybe Celine, you can read John um, 21, verse 15 to 17. And it's also long. I think I didn't also put it because it was long. Maybe it's easier to read. So Jesus reinstates Peter. So uh, John 21, 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Mm. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, John, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Mm. So Jesus said, feed my sheep. Amen. So when Jesus said, before Jesus sent John to do a very important task of feeding his sheep, he didn't ask John, what's your experience? What's your resume? You know, uh, where do you work in? What is your qualification? He didn't. All he asked John is, do you love me? Three times. Do you love me? 
again, do you love me? See, Jesus knows that our love for God determines our capacity and our commitment for God. Amen. So work on your relationship. Work on falling deeper and deeper in love with God. Amen. Because He is a God of love. Amen. When you approach Him in that, He absorbs you. It takes time. I mean, do we develop relationship? I mean, like Gerald and I, when we see each other, the love that we have is not when we see each other, it's the years behind us that comes. So we have to build those years with Jesus. So when it is our love, all of us are planted in different places. All of us can reach people. You can reach people, I can't. I can reach people, Jared can't. Jared can reach people, Tosha can't. It's like this. And he has planned us peculiarly in where we are. So if our love is for Jesus, our eyes will be for his people. We will see their heart ache. We will see where they are hurting. We will see their needs. So those of us in the later part of our life should be doing that too because we could discern deeply. We can go for tea, for dinner with friends and if we go in with the Spirit, we would discern because He needs us to be hands and mouths and feet for Him. Amen. So, you know, so the, Jesus says, do you love me? So that's where the test of our commitment to Him is our love. Not our, what we do, what our qualification is, and not our experience. So when I started working, uh, so when I, uh, my new life in Canada, right there, and when I started to work, um, it, it's also the time that I started to learn this uh, this um, teaching at Lord about living as pilgrim, living as sojourner, you know, as temporary resident. I started to learn that, you know, as because um, even as I am so grateful for where he had led me to these big opportunities and that also sent me home to work with the people, I thought I lost all my contacts, right? You know, actually I'm coming back and it's just those contacts and experience that really got, got me into this area. But still, daily I'm reminded that I'm working in unfamiliar territory. Remember, I'm already in my 50s. I have certain fixed practices and then I come into this area of uh, totally, um, basically, of course, I was given a new portfolio. I was in corporate securities before I left all these years working litigation and corporate securities. Going over there, I'm given the portfolio to work with families to transition wealth and leadership, something I've not done before. And I'm working in a new legal system in that sense, right? And of course, there is a situation whereby it's a new community. And the firm that I work with has about 700 odd lawyers across Canada. And they have um, about 100 years of history behind them. So therefore, it, I'm facing entrenched practices, entrenched expectations. And therefore, daily, I would go to the Lord and say, I'm not ungrateful. I'm grateful that you led me to this place. But, you know, this is my, yeah, this is always my question to the Lord. I say, as I navigate my journey in the alien landscape, how do I inhabit a biblical mindset towards my calling in the marketplace? That's what I constantly ask the Lord. I don't want to work with a complaining mindset. Oh, why is this like this? Why is this done like that? I don't want. I want to embrace the differences and see how I could contribute. So I want to have a biblical mindset. In a way, uh, I, in a way, I was like asking what the psalmist asked. How does one sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? That's how I felt. This is the foreign land, but how do I sing the Lord's song? The first, um, the first teaching 
the Lord sent my way was to understand his declaration in Psalm, I think in Psalm, yeah, Psalm 24 1. So the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. So the Lord is telling me, the whole world is mine. And everything and everyone in it. There's no foreign land to the Lord. The whole world is this. So as foreign as Canada was to me, it is my father's land. Amen. Yeah. As difficult and new was the work, the assignment that was given to me, it was the Father's work designed for me to undertake with Him. And as new as the um, Canadian community was to me, they are my Father's children, made in His image. So I'm not lost in Canada. I'm rooted in God, doing His work, serving His people. So that really opened my heart. You know how it is, when you're all over there, your heart always pine for home. But the Lord said, you are home. You are where I want you to be. You're not in a foreign land. That really, you know, it is how we listen to the Lord rather than listen to our biased mind, our selfish desire, it's how we open to Him. And then I realized, when I walked out, when I realized that whenever I walked out of the house to go to the office, I say, I am going to another part of my father's home, the office, <laughs> right? When I come back home or I go to the supermarket, I'm going back. And all the people I see are His children, stand with His image. So that opens my heart, you know. So, and um, then when I start to journey with him, um, he prepared my heart to know more. You know, it was just trying to grapple with being in a strange environment, trying to learn the new lingo, but he then started my heart to learn more. And he started to let me see that although the whole world is his, every inch of it, this is not our permanent home. Amen. Our permanent home is the new heavens and new earth. It will be transformed, this, but until transformation, we are on a journey to the new heavens and new earth. So, and um, while we are here, we are to live and work as pilgrims, as people passing through. Because that mindset is a totally different mindset. I'll go into it a bit more about a pilgrim mindset. And we have to start to embrace it. Because if we know our true identity as children of God, and we know where He places us at different time of our life, we will act accordingly. So what is the mindset as a pilgrim? So, you know, uh, when um, Hebrew 11, 3. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So, you know, he Hebrews 11, we all know, celebrates the heroes of faith. It's all talking about the heroes of faith. And 11, 6, talk about them, that they have they were assured, they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. It's planted there for us to understand. We are pilgrims. You want to be hero of it? First thing is to have your mindset right when you are planted here. Are we here as permanent citizen or are we here as pilgrim passing through? So, and you remember I was saying that uh, talking about when I came to Canada, I, I clung on to uh, um, Hebrew 8, I think about Abraham, that, you know, he left and then he went to a place that he didn't know where he was going, but he followed God. But God later on led me to interact deeply and pray in, over, I think, the next slide, 11, 19, yeah. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. See, Abraham was already 
in the place, in the land of promise. He was like that, he knew. Finally, the journey is over, he is in the land of promise. Yet, he lived there as in a foreign country. <coughs> he lived there for he waited for the city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. So we must understand our time here is a journey towards our ultimate home in the new heavens and new earth. Now, some of us would think, oh, well, you know, um, since we are just passing through, we could live footloose fancy free. I mean, we don't really have to um, do much because this world is going to collapse and, and the, be another new, have a new earth will be there. So if that's the case, if you think that, well, since we are just passes by, we don't really have to get ourselves involved, you know, work and uh, build for the, build for whatever that we, that's been placed before us. But if we think that way then, then I ask each of us to remember Jesus, right? Jesus himself lived here and yet he is the most heavenly minded. Although he was here, he's always looking towards heaven. But he didn't just say, I'm just here for salvation and then I will be up in heaven. He didn't. When he was here, he suffered, he bled, he poured his heart out for the people here. And that's what we are to do. While we are on this side of heaven, we are to spend our life working with the people he has put before us, doing the jobs that he has, the callings that he has led us to, looking to our neighbor's welfare because he has planted them as our neighbors to us. This is what it is when we are here. But our heart posture is always heaven bound because that gives us the um, the just zest to know where we are heading. This is not the last word of God we are just passing through. So pilgrim mindset is a, is a mindset whereby we are not just people passing through, but we're pilgrims. So that is so, uh, uh, it, it is a pilgrim mindset is something that look, look at all the heroes of faith. They all talk about they are here for the time, but they're always looking afar. Because when you look afar, you bring the joy of heaven into our hearts. And with that joy, we serve the people and the work he has placed before us. We build, he built what he wants to, us to do here, and we will bring what our good work, we will bring it to heaven too, that's for sure. That's another, an, a, a, another uh, uh, talk about, right? But, that's what we should. Eyes on heaven, but work as a pilgrim. What are the mindset then? When we're talking about this, uh, this comes to the pilgrim mindset. Um, in one of the, yeah, maybe we have the next slide. Yeah. So in one of the lectures that I attended in region, uh, professor, the professor is uh, David, Reverend David, and he put on the this, this slides for us in class to show us on the one side of this class is Jerusalem. Jerusalem here meaning heavenly mindset. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do we have a, a situation where we always look towards heaven? And the other one is exile. Like exile, well, we are here, that's it. We, we, are, we are not even thinking of heaven. We are here and that's all it is. We try the best to do the best that is over here. So, and he... Um, he, yeah, so I will just kind of roughly go through this. On the left hand side is where we think the side of heaven is already our home, our ultimate home is here. The right hand side is like we are only in exile, but we will be going to our ultimate home. So the first one is dominant culture and minority culture. So we live as Christian, we live in a culture that is so averse to the Christian way. And the, the working trends in the marketplace are so entrenched, so insidious, that many of us 
don't even realize how they are influencing us, how they are affecting our behavior. We are just kind of going with the flow. We, if we don't stop to see, we are just, you know, because they're so entrenched, it's so solid, the marketplace. And we do not see, and sometimes, or rather sometimes we may see, oh, this is not right. Uh, this, uh, somebody is, has been overloaded here. This is causing injustice. Sometimes we may see it. And yet, we may be too busy or too timid to do anything. Because when we see something is wrong, some practice is wrong, somebody is being victimized, some processes are not fair, we say maybe we'll do it tomorrow. Or, or let's think about it. And we never get around to think about it later. Once you say you think about it, you know what? You, you have to write it down and pray with the Lord and ask the Spirit to, to give you discernment as what to do. But a lot of times we are hesitant to be involved because if you want to start change, um, it takes your time. It involves you being involved, getting things done. Secondly, is a lot of time you bring opposition. People would not like the status quo to be changed. So we tend to kind of, we want to move on. But, so we, the first one I say, I think I forgot to, the next slide. Yeah, dominant culture, but as Christian, we live as minority culture. And what does Romans 12 to say to us? And do not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, you know, as a Christians, we are expected to work as salt and light, to be leavened, to bring changes from within the dominant system. We are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So, of course, in a world that's so fraught with corruption, so fraught with broken practices, some of us will feel um, like a sense of futility, a sense of defeat. What's the point of doing it? It's been done for years. You just got into an organization, you see something is wrong, and you think you, you can be the one to do it. We are to be the agent of change. You see, we must remind each other that the Bible testifies to the grace of God, redemptive grace of God. That's what the Bible, we either believe the Bible or we don't. The Bible testifies to the redemptive grace of God, which is already at work. Jesus, I mean, as Christians, we must look at every institution, every practice, every organization, Every process, we must look at it and believe that it's already been stamped with Jesus' mark of redemption. Amen. The process has already started. Jesus has started the process of restoring people and processes and organization and institution to where he desires to be. The question is, are we going to be part of this change? Are we going to be one of the change agents he has put where we are placed? Wherever we are placed, there are broken brands. Are we looking around and saying, God, what is wrong and where do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And ask the Spirit to give you boldness, to give you discernment, to work within the system, within the dominant system to bring in the kingdom of God. Jesus is giving us this stretch. He has his own timing. The will has started. Redemption has started. Are you on the train of the conquerors? Or are you just stepping sideline and say, I drum my finger, get my work done, go home every day, and just advance myself in my career? Or are you, while working well, still looking around and saying, what needs to be done? What needs to be changed? Lord, give me the spirit of discernment. Lord, give me the courage to speak. Lord, give me the team members to work with. And together, we will step by step. Bring, we pray, thy kingdom come. What are we doing? Thy will be. 
in, on earth as it is in heaven. Are we part of this, of kingdom coming? Because he has started it, the process, and that's important. And, and daily, you will see, if you open your eyes, what is wrong, and you can pray, are you the right person to go? So that's, that's the, 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 this part. You know, um, you know, presently I actually see God's redemptive activities everywhere. Everywhere. One of the main things in the corporate side is ESG, environmental, social, you know, and governance. So, you know, we, they, we have done so badly in how we treated God's world. And now look at how God has bring the whole different segments of community around to respond to how to retard, to slow, stop the, not to stop, but to retard the pace of how we are destroying the world. And they're bringing legislatures, they're bringing governments, they're bringing um, employees, they're bringing consumers who will speak about it, they're bringing investors, Oh, you think it is, if we think, oh, all these people are coming around the table uh, by accident or, uh, or because of needs. We are very short-sighted. The hand of God is moving in the corporate world. hand of God is moving in every field to bring these people together to start because redemption has already started. We are living in a time between already and not yet. Will you be counted as one of the agents in this period? This is all up to us, how we will look at it. So that's, that's this part of dominant. And um, the other one I have, I think, is uh, building own kingdom and prospering alien kingdom. If we think this world is all that is, or we're just drumming our finger to think, you know, we're just abiding our time, then while we are here, we want to do everything that makes our life comfortable. We want to um, uh, build our wealth. We want to build our reputation. We want to build our, um, uh, uh, you know, our presence in the community. That's all we are looking at. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So if we know that our ultimate home is the new heavens, the new earth, we want to now work with God and hope that our work here will also become treasures in heaven. We know that, that, you know, we know that what we do here can be reflected in heaven. Would we find some of the work that we do and continue in heaven? Or will our work be shown in showcase in the museum in heaven that show this is not what you should be doing. It is all up to us to we realize that we are in that sense working with God, building the kingdom to come, but while here serving his people. So this is the mindset uh, of you know living with a pilgrim mindset. Because if you think you are not a pilgrim passing through, you are this is all that is, you do everything for your own comfort. I have the next one which is similar. Um, yeah, this next slide. Yeah. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, if we expect comfort here, then we need to skip Matthew seven fourteen. We will, when we read the Bible verse, we will skip it because it says, "Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God." It's a, it's a difficult um, Bible to read in that sense, you know, um, to think that we will be persecuted. But, you know, we have to learn to understand, we have to understand in a way pain and pleasure to be equated to suffering for Christ and glory in Christ. Once we start to see it, once we start to see that when we do God's work, we do have opposition, we do have persecution, and we look upon that and identify ourselves with the God we love, suffering with the God we love, 
and we look toward to the new heavens and new earth to see the glory as being the glory of God for us. Then we start to understand that expectation of comfort is something that's fleeting. But if we know discomfort for God will build the kingdom, then it brings us around with a different dynamic. So we have to ask ourselves, are we just living here to be comfortable? Or are we going out what they call on a limb for Jesus? And say, I'll pick up that cross. I'll speak into that even though I may be unpopular. I'll walk alongside these people who have been marginalized because I know God's placed me for such a vocation. We have to ask ourselves that. Identity secured, identity challenge. Do you find your identity in what you're doing in the world? You know where you are, where you're placed. You walk in a place you think, I'm so-and-so, uh, you know, and introduce yourself and always thinking about that identity. Well, I certainly did. You know, I certainly, um, although I say that I'm a child of God, but I clung on to my marketplace identity. I, so when I was stripped of that, I felt I was lost in the world. It was, you know, I remember crying in a way it was so difficult because you felt as if you had lost yourself. But when you found yourself in God, identity challenge and when you are challenged and you find yourself because as God being Christians we will we, Jesus asked us to remember that we have died in that sense we have died and our life is hidden with Christ and God we always have to ask ourselves what does it mean to me when I say my life is hidden with Christ and God so I'm not saying that we are to strip off, we are to just to forget all our marketplace identities and all this. No, but they are tools. They do not define you. You may be so and so, you may be a member of parliament, you may be this or good. These are tools that you can use to serve God. But they do not define your inner being, who you are. Who we are, we are a child of that is our identity. The marketplace identities, we can use them. Very important to use them. But we use them, they don't define us. That is what is important. And then um, inward and outward orientation, right? So the, the world tells us to serve our own interests. That's inward. Do everything. Look after yourself. Look after your purse. Look after your bank account. Look after your family. Inward. Jesus, what does Jesus say? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yeah. So Jesus asked us outward orientation. When it's inward all about me, the other one is about him. But when we say it's about him, does it mean we lost everything? No, we gain everything because we are rich in Christ. If you trust in that, see how he works for you. So he say, come, you desire to come after me, you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Who? Jesus. And when you're following Jesus, you are on the safest path. Does it mean we won't suffer? Does it mean we won't uh, be victimized? Of course we will. We are living in a broken world. If not, we won't need to think of the new heaven and new earth and pine for it. We will. But who do we suffer with? Christ. And when you suffer and you remember him, suddenly your suffering becomes a sweetness. I wouldn't say it's a pleasure. I will still complain to God. <laughs> I'm a complainer. I will still complain. But there is this sweetness I can taste because I could identify with you. He is a good, good God. Amen. You know, it's good, good God. And then um, what do we have the next one, the last one we have here? Yeah. So, if we look upon this earth as all there is, then we become very triumphant 
when we feel that you know um, we have established ourselves, we have a certain reputation, we have certain following, we will feel that. And yet Jesus tells us, wherever we are, however high in the society you may be, he asks us to have a servant attitude. What does he say in Mark 10, 45? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. That is where the Lord wants us to understand that while we are on this side of heaven, we serve him and his people. And through that, we gain glory in the new heavens and new earth with him. Jesus is not one that says, just suffer, 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 and that's it. Oh, he built us for joy. Amen. Right? He built us, he created us to enjoy heavens. But there was the fall, and we continue to fall. But once we become a Christian, there can be a break. We start to work with him. So, you know, um, I will end here. Um, to say that, you know, we have considered some of the perspectives of what pilgrims living in. I mean, these are just some of the perspectives that kind of say, if you're, if you're thinking this world is your kingdom, this is what you do. But if we know we are only pilgrims passing through, then we will have a different mindset. We will have, once you start to know that you're working with God on the side of heaven, you will have a skip in your steps. Don't you agree? You will, you will be let out of the door daily and say, what next? What's next, God? What do you want me to do? And you will have that skip because you know, first of all, He's with you every minute of it. It's just that our heart is not open to hearing it. But if we are, get into the habit. What's next, God? Always get into the habit. What do you want me to do now? always get into the habit of mumbling to him. He will hear you and you will hear, start to discern his voice clearly. Because he, he is a God that seeks us. So therefore, you know, in one of the, um, yes, I have this here. So, you know, we talk about the fact that when we think about, when we learn certain things, we want to integrate in our life. Same, right? Uh, even you learn about good exercise, what do you do? You want to integrate it as part of your routine, becomes part of you. So, and uh, one of the, um, Professor Paul Stevens, uh, he is the uh, Professor Emeritus for Marketplace Theology in Region. So, and uh, in one of the time we were spending together, he was saying this, he said, integration, and it just struck me, you know, so I, I recorded every word he said. See, integration is not so much an intellectual concept that you grasp. It is more like a craft or a skill that you practice. So when we think of the six various things and other things that make us live like pilgrims, they are not just concepts you put on the wall and uh, kind of know that they, they are somewhere pointed out in the, in the Bible. No. Integration is, means you start to practice them. You start to grasp it like so that it is something that becomes part of your life. So in that sense, I hope that we will start to think about how to draw our sight to heaven. And with that sight, it empowers and emboldens us to live now for him. So, so and we hope that we will bring the joy of heaven into our life and in the life of others and be a testimony to them. So thank you.